Welcome to Bamford Rose and it's forum chat time. In this week's forum chat, we take a look at the onboard diagnostic system of your Aston Martin. Now, how many forum posts do you see where the poster reports a check engine light or a service engine soon or a car that's in limp home? Now, if you want an insight into all of that onboard diagnostic stuff on your Aston, uh, given to you by an engineer that actually programmed the system, then you'll want to watch this week's forum chat. So stick around and we'll get into Aston Martin onboard diagnostics. Now, the first real onboard diagnostic system came in in about 1988, and this was the Californian Air Research Bureau, or CARB, which stipulated a set of rules for real basic monitoring of the emission system. So this would have been really simple checks on stuff like the coolant sensor, mass airflow meter or on a manifold absolute pressure sensor. So that if something really basic went wrong, then either a check engine light or a service engine soon light came on the dashboard. So the onboard diagnostic system is intended to measure if there's an excess of pollution due to a fault. So they reckoned that despite cars passing emission standards to gain entry into the marketplace, when they were in the market, if there were certain faults, uh, could be a simple spark plug and a misfire, resulting in a bit of hydrocarbons and unburnt fuel, therefore polluting the environment over which the standard that the car was signed off to, then they reckon most emissions was actually being put out by faulty cars rather than the cars being in the marketplace at their stipulated emissions level. So that first OBD1 standard was so simple that it wasn't really effective. So in about 96, 97, they came up with OBD2. Now this was much more tighter, stricter monitoring of many more components, because the theory is that if anything affects performance drivability, fuel economy, then it affects emissions. So really, no matter what the failure on the car, a sensor, a spark plug, a throttle blade, anything like that, it's going to affect the emissions output and therefore the fault must be monitored and a light must come on the dash to alert the driver. I think if you follow the history from 1988, then OBD1 was California Air Research Bureau, CARB for short. In 96, 97, it sort of turned into the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency in North America, and CARB and EPA standards sort of aligned. And then Euro followed those levels of check-in and emission standards and probably something like EU 4, 5, then all of those European and North American spec uh, standards came into roughly broad alignment. So I've been very fortunate in my career working for different car companies. I've put emissions, drivability, performance and calibration of engines into productions for EU 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So that spans from about 95 up to about 2015-16. That gives me a great overview of the legislation and how it changed over the years and what its meaning is, and we'll come on to what its meaning is and how that notifies you as a driver of what's wrong with your car. And I've also had experience how different car companies handle complying with those rules. So let's check out how different car companies comply with those rules first, and then we can relate that to how your Aston is behaving for you. So as a car company, and if you're in the legal and certification department or the emissions and drivability and calibration department, you can decide if you are going to just scrape the barrel and comply with the very basic rules, or you're gonna take the system further to help out your consumers when they've got the car in the marketplace and to help them diagnose and resolve problems if the car has a problem. 
Now a good example of a project that I worked on where the automaker wanted their system to be the very, very best it could be for the consumer was the BMW Mini. Now, when that project uh, was nearing completion and the car was driving perfectly, they wanted the onboard diagnostic system to always tell the consumer or a mechanic when they're plugging in a laptop what was wrong with the car, but they never wanted the car to break down. So they tried as much as they could to get the engine to run off backup maps. So for instance, if the crank sensor failed, the system would then look at camshaft speed, halve it, and there was your inferred engine speed. If the mass airflow sensor broke, wasn't reporting uh, airflow for combustion gas supply, then there was a manifold absolute pressure sensor in place and that would infer an airflow from a manifold absolute pressure. Now that took an awful lot of extra engineering to get that system working and it was quite phenomenal when it was working because you could go around the engine, disconnect loads of sensors and the engine would still run uh, working off backup maps. Now basically all you need is either a cam or crank sensor, you need your throttle body working, you need some injection and as long as you've got that then it didn't matter what else wasn't working because the engine would run off backup maps. It really was quite phenomenal. Now, this was very, very good because if there was a failure, then the car didn't break down. And then because the system was programmed to that level of sophistication, when the car went into a dealership and a technician plugged into it with a laptop, it was pretty good at identifying what was the fault, making the fix very, very easy. Now that level of sophistication was BMW's choice to make because they could have just complied with the very minimum that the legislation needed, which was to put a light on when something that affects the emissions goes wrong. So to be able to reach the end outcome of an engine running off backup maps and a very sophisticated um, backup system and a fault monitoring and uh, detection system than the engine management system itself. Uh, the software algorithms within the electronic control box, the ECU, that has to be very sophisticated. So back in the day, you normally had Bosch or Continental Siemens systems that were at that level of sophistication. And both BMWs wish to give the consumer, the best driving car, the most fault-free product, was enabled by a sophisticated ECU to start with. It was pretty much cutting edge at the time. Now if we look at the Aston ECU, it's a Ford-based ECU with Ford algorithms. And in 2004, when that came out in DB9, it was probably the same sort of technology that Ford was using a whole 10 years previous. So whilst BMW Mini had released something that was cutting edge, uh, the factory Ford ECU uh, was already 10 years out of date. Now this is important because that tells you from the start whether that out of date ECU could reach that same level of sophistication in fault code um, checking and backup Mac running like the BMW did. Now, if that ECU can't do that from the outset, then there's absolutely no chance of the automaker reaching that end outcome that BMW reached, where the car can run off backup maps and when you plug into it, it tells you exactly what's wrong. When they make their ECU with a supplier like Bosch, Bosch will be taking certain algorithms off the shelf, spark algorithm, fuel algorithm, drivability, emissions, and they'll take all those strategies and make an ECU. And then they'll be saying to the automaker, well, do you want this uh, sophisticated level of OBD checking? Do you want uh, automatic brake and crash and airbag deployment? Do you want automatic cruise control strategies? And all these sorts of things. So there'll be a basic ECU which is needed to get any car running and passing legislation and then there'll be a much more expensive ECU that's got every single bell and whistle algorithm in it for a cutting edge car.
So although you're using a state-of-the-art Bosch controller, if you're an automaker that wants to cut costs, and we don't know any of those, do we? Then you can have the end result where you comply with legislation, but your car goes wrong and people that plug into it don't know why and owners suffer lots of faults and lights and they don't know why either. Sound familiar? That's because it wasn't legislation to put that BMW standard fault code checking and backup map running into production. How if we relate that history to the brand that we work on? Then here's a couple of examples. Now there was a Vanquish S in the workshop a year or so ago and it would run quite rough at idle and it just wasn't producing full power out on the road. Now the onboard diagnostic system check engine soon light uh, wasn't coming on straight away. You take it for a drive and then it would come on. But when you plugged into it, there was absolutely no codes whatsoever to say what the fault was. It was saying that there was a generic misfire, but it didn't say for what reason. So now, if you use that BMW uh, example, clever engineers have programmed that onboard diagnostic system checking and problem identification, meaning that when a technician plugs into it, they can diagnose they can see on the laptop what the fault code is and put it right straight away. Now if the car company chose not to go to that extent of fault code checking because they don't have to then it means to solve problems the engineer needs to be in the workshop rather than the engineer of coding that software. Now this is what causes a lot of garages problems because they plug in to the car, there's no fault codes and the technician reach a dead end. You need an engineer to come in with an engineer's mindset to logically go through systems, rule out stuff it isn't, uh, to hone in on the problem that it is. Now back to that vanquish uh, that we had in the workshop. Uh, take it for a drive, run in a bit rough. There's a generic fault code coming on for misfire. Uh, no fault codes to say which component is in error. So bring it back into the workshop and you start changing components, trying to find out what it is and is not. Obviously you start with the easy stuff, start with the accessible stuff, start with the cheap stuff. And it also helps if the workshop has got a lot of slave um, spare components. So you're not buying components that a customer doesn't have to have to fix their problem. You can just trial a load of workshop components and see what the problem is. And then when you've found what it is, you only have to bill the customer for the one component that they needed. So in this case, we'd been through a load of sensors and we were pretty much drawn a blank. Uh, on those sort of things, you just got to leave it for a day or so uh, and then come back to it when you've got a clear head. So we changed pretty much everything, but we hadn't changed the crank sensor. So someone in the workshop says, hey, on that Vanquish, why don't we change the crank sensor? And I said, well, we've got an engine speed. Um, so um, it's working. But then closer look at the engine speed and it was to about five or six decimal places uh, on the diagnostic system laptop, which looked a bit odd because uh, normal engine speed isn't to that many decimal points. So we put a new crankshaft sensor in and hey presto, the car was working fine. Um, didn't run rough, the OBD light didn't come on and the problem was fixed. Look at engine speed on the diagnostic laptop and it's to about one or two decimal places. And then it, it triggered, okay. So it was running a backup. That's why the number to seven decimal places, um, or it was to seven decimal places because it was a calculated theoretical number. It wasn't actually a measured number. Uh, and despite that problem, it wasn't putting the OBD light on for crank sensor. It didn't ever have a fault in the engine management system fault code read that said crank sensor. So that's a good example of a system at the opposite end of the scale to the very good BMW system that I mentioned earlier.
Over the years, I can use many examples, but there's a few that just stay in my head. The other will be a six-speed V12 Vantage from 2010 or 11. Now this car came in firing only on six cylinders. It was only firing on the uh, driver's side and not the passenger side. Plugged in and absolutely no fault codes to say why. Uh, so this is the Ford engine management system. So this is the older system that Aston used before Bosch on that six speed V12 Vantage. So again, go through a process of elimination of all easy stuff. Now it was not applying any uh, fuel pump and the rail pressure was uh, reading low. But at key on, the fuel pump would do a prime. So that told us that the fuel pump driver module, uh, the, the fuel pump itself was fine. You know, swap DCUs just in case it was a fuel pump driver chip in ECU. No, that wasn't the fault. But pretty much straight away, you realize that the problem isn't fuel. Now, engine speed was being picked up on that side. Mass airflow was being picked up on that side. So the ECU was, was alive. It was um, monitoring data and, and it was calculating data. So this is a really strange problem. Now, there were no other fault codes on the rest of the car. So in these cases now, you realize that this problem is going to be real tricky to fix, as a lot of these problems are on Aston's. Uh, that's because it's far away from the BMW example of uh, perfection. So the engine management system works on the high speed CAN circuit. So there's obviously something on that circuit which isn't quite right. So all you can resort to in that circumstance, and this is where because the engineer never programmed the onboard diagnostics to be helpful, you need the engineer now in the workshop to solve the problem. So disconnect all of the high speed can. So basically you've only got the engine uh, control unit and the body module and the engine is working fine. So we've got the engine running on 12 cylinders because everything on the high speed can is now disconnected. So we start to plug in different parts of the high speed can network. And module by module started reconnecting, engine was still running on 12 cylinders. And then we plugged in the steering rack sensor and the engine went to running on six cylinders. So it turns out the pressure switch in the steering rack had failed. Now, on a Ford or another car uh, of my own that I'm aware of, when a sensor malfunctions like this, maybe there's an internal short in the sensor, and that's sending some sort of dodgy signal up the CAN communication network, which the body module interprets as some other signal, and there's some other hiccup that is caused because of that. In this instance, it stopped the engine running on one bank of cylinders. Now, the steering rack sensor could be diagnosed for um, it's signal that it puts out a feed voltage is short to ground or stuff like that. And on a Ford car of mine, I've known the sensor be monitored for erratic signal. Now in the Aston, it's not. So there was some sort of erratic behavior for that sensor that was giving um, a signal up the body module line, which was causing the corrupted signal to knock out one bank of of, of cylinders. So when the new steering um, sensor was put in, uh, there wasn't that corrupted signal and the engine was running perfect. So this is just an example of where a fundamental fault has happened on a car. There isn't reporting of that fundamental fault uh, and that fault has caused something else to not work. Another example is a car, a V8 Vantage convertible that came in and every time you operated the roof, on the dashboard, it said slow down to uh, operate roof, but the car was stationary. So as we know on convertibles, you have to be lower than something like 20 mile an hour. And uh, if you're lower road speed than 20 mile an hour, your roof will work. So if you're at 30, 40 mile an hour and you try to operate the roof, it won't. And it will say on the dashboard, slow down to operate roof. So it was saying slow down to operate roof whilst the car was stationary. 
Um, again, uh, plug in, no indication as to why that's happening. So because the onboard diagnostics has not been programmed sophisticatedly enough by engineers for the factory, you now need the engineers in the workshop to get to the bottom of that problem. Again, uh, removal of a few simple, easy components, nothing sorted out uh, the fault at all. Um, the, the fault remained. Now, the roof module was on the low speed CAN network. So everything on the low speed CAN network was disconnected and that's an awful lot of electronics on the car. Lots of door modules, uh, parking sensor modules, other non-critical stuff that doesn't work on high speed signals. Um, so all of that low speed uh, CAN was uh, disconnected. And then suddenly with everything disconnected, the roof started working. So now one module by one module, plug in everything. And we got to the point where we plugged in the passenger door and then the roof didn't uh, work anymore. So, aha, uh -huh, we know that the problem is in the passenger door somewhere. So what happened on this car? is that water had got into the window regulator, it shorted the printed circuit board out, and that was resulting in a corrupted signal being sent up the low speed CAN network line, which the body module had interpreted as a real signal of road speed. So road speed was at its maximum, which is a mathematical 1600 RPM on that car. Um, and because the body module thought the car was doing 1600 mile an hour. That's why even when the car was stationary, it said slow down to operate roof. Again, a good example of a rudimentary diagnostic system where a fault is present, it's just not detected. Not, the system hasn't been clever enough to figure out that it's not a real signal, it's a fault. You know, maybe if the car had used a couple of other sanity checks, um, is it in gear? Uh, what's the the airflow through the engine management system? What's the torque output? It could have realized itself that that 1600 miles per hour was implausible and maybe stored a fault code in the background but still operated the roof. Now, a, a sophisticated system could have done that, but you know, we're not quite talking quite a, a sophisticated si system on the car that we're talking about here. So, short story long. That's what gets us to the point on forums where lots of people are talking about check engine light, service engine soon, errors, no real fault codes in the body module or engine control units, and people just burning hours in workshops that haven't got engineers in to sort problems out where computer isn't saying no, computer saying nothing. You know, that Aston Martin diagnostic system is only of use to use as a tool to find root cause, where as we know, technicians at certain garages, normally the garages with big glossy frontages, marble floor, glass see-through walls, technicians are only ever able to plug computer in and if computer isn't saying no or computer isn't identifying the problem uh, then you know they reach their limit uh, and it needs an engineer to resolve the problem now obviously some forums are good at identifying a few key things to check so at least someone can rule out that problem but there's a lot of hocus pocus that gets written on forums and there's a couple of DIY groups uh, that for us are a great source of comedy. Uh, please, uh, if you're posted on those forums or administrator of them, keep them going because we wouldn't know what to do with our coffee breaks if we couldn't take a laugh of some of the stupidity that is spieled on some of these forums. Now, to be fair, this poster here has got it right. Uh, he, he says that, you know, you might as well sprinkle pixie dust uh, on the car to try and fix your problem. You need an engineer, you need a laptop, and you need to go through a certain level of uh, meth methodical fault code and, and systems checking to get to root cause your problem. 
And why do you need that on the Aston? Well, it's because unlike that BMW example of perfection, then there just wasn't that above and beyond level of um, onboard diagnostics, backup maps, and fault code interpreting and reading uh, that's put into certainly the Ford engine management system. And based on that example I gave of the Vanquish, it doesn't appear that it's in the Bosch engine management system either. Anyway, that's just my view on it. If you've got a different view, then put it in the comments section and we can understand more about Aston and onboard diagnostics and fault code reporting and how technicians plug in or don't uh, find out what's wrong with the car and fix them. And now this goes some way to explain other posts on forums that you see where, you know, maybe it's not franchise, maybe it's not a brand specialist. It's gone to, you know, what is probably a good performance car centre. They've got limited onboard diagnostic um, fault code handheld checkers maybe they've got an autel system something like that maybe a fox well maybe it's quite sophisticated they've downloaded the software but no matter what they try and do they can't tell you what's wrong and i see this frustrating quite a few owners that they've taken it to garages they've paid for a diagnostic session and that garage has not been able to get to root cause now that is not the fault of uh, your garage, not the fault of the Autel kit, not the fault of the Foxwell kit, because those kits are only reading what the ECU is telling them. If the ECU was never programmed in such a way to be super, super helpful, then you need uh, more engineering uh, ability to get to root cause. So that's why a lot of cars out there just go around many garages, um, unsuccessfully having their problems identified until it can go to somewhere where they've got an engineer and you're able to get to root cause of problems using a skill set that most technicians don't have. I hope that's been insightful on onboard diagnostics and how your car reacts to certain problems. Might now explain some things now you know that sort of backstory. Always helps us if you can subscribe to us, click us a like, give us your comments on onboard diagnostics and your Aston. And we'll see you on next week's forum chat.